Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Also, just a quick note that submissions for the Zibby Awards are open and will close on September 15th. Go to zibbyowens.com and you will find the Zibby Awards open submissions where we celebrate all the under-celebrated parts of a book, like the best spine, the best author's note, the best table of contents. And authors can nominate their own best publicists, best editors, and so on. There will be an in-person award ceremony in October in New York. You will not want to miss it go to zibbyowens.com. Catherine Schultz is the author of Lost and Found, a memoir. Catherine is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of Being Wrong. She won a National Magazine Award and a Pulitzer Prize for, quote, the really big one, her article about seismic risk in the Pacific Northwest. Lost and Found grew out of Losing Streak, a New Yorker story that was anthologized in the Best American Essays. Her work has also appeared in the Best American Science and Nature Writing, the Best American Travel Writing, and the Best American Food Writing. A native of Ohio, she lives with her family on the eastern shore of Maryland. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Lost and Found, a memoir. Thank you so much for having me on the program. FYI, this was one of the titles that I was going to call my memoir bookends, which is coming out. I was like, I want to call it Lost and Found. And uh, anyway, it was taken by you. So That is so funny. Well, I gather you can't copyright a title, so, you know, feel free to, feel free no, to no, use it also. But <laughs> <laughs> Although yours sounds lovely, I wouldn't change it. No, no, no. It's great. I, I, and it is a great title. So there you go. And as is the cover and everything. Okay. So your reflections on the concepts of loss and being found and your last section, and were very thought-provoking and interesting. And you are, oh my gosh, just such an like introspective. I mean, it's almost like, like I feel like I learned so much. You drove, you brought in so much knowledge in addition to your own personal experience. So, anyway, why don't you tell listeners they don't already know what Lost and Found is about? Sure, I would be happy to. Uh, so, Truth in Advertising. We were discussing the title, and the title actually tells you quite a lot about how the book works. It's in three parts. The first part is lost. The second part is found, and the third part, uh, the kind of strange part at the end, is and. The lost part is anchored in the story of the death of my father and my grief afterward. But it's actually a much larger exploration of this very strange category of loss. You know, I got interested in why it is that we talk about losing our loved ones, but also our car keys and our cell phones and our elections and our faith and our minds. I mean, we just put an enormous number of things, very, very different things into the same category. And so I was interested in exploring that larger idea of loss, uh, again, with, with the story of my grief over my dad at the at the heart of that. And then the found section is kind of a perfect mirror image of that. It's an exploration of the equally weird category of discovery that somehow contains, you know, like, the missing sock that we finally find after seven wash cycles, uh, but also, you know, dinosaur fossils and, and vaccines for global pandemics and faith and the love of our lives. And that section of the book is in fact in, anchored uh, in a love story. It's it's about meeting and falling in love with my partner. And then the final section of the book, that and section at the end, came about because I had the experience of finding my partner and losing my father in pretty quick succession. So it's partly about that, you know, about, about the way that in grown up life, you know, we, we would all love to just be falling in love or for that matter, to, to just be grieving someone we loved and not have to do anything else, but inevitably we're doing many, many things at once and feeling many things at once. Uh, so it, it, it is about that kind of and quality of life uh, and about connection and including not just the connections between, you know, 
love and grief and joy and sorrow, but but also the connections among all of us. Oh, that was a beautiful description. It's true. I mean, loss, it, it would be so convenient, right? If you could literally just do what they did in the olden days and sort of lock yourself away and deal with it. But that is not the case at all. You don't have a second. Like emails continue to come in. Everything keeps going at its warp speed. It's it's almost hard to process. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, we uh, it, it's a strange thing, even even with a difficult emotion, uh, and, and in a way this makes a lot of sense, we want to be left alone with it. We want to just be able to kind of sit there inside it. And I I think that impulse makes a lot of sense, and it's, you know, deeply connected to just how very much we, we loved the, the person that we lost when we're grieving. Uh, but I think on balance, it's probably a good thing that, that life doesn't operate that way, you know, that something else is always happening and something else demands our attention. And that's true. You know, they're, we, they're, yeah, we, we, we don't get to just sit there in our that's grief. True. We have to, Benefit. right, pay attention to our toddler or, or, you know, our partner or our job or whatever it may be. Yeah, we have this whole thing called moms don't have time to grieve. <laughs> because, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, that nothing stops, right? The tantrums don't stop. Nothing stops. But you're right. The distraction can be a blessing as well. You made a, a really interesting point in the beginning in the last section when you, and I'm so sorry for the loss of your father, but you talked about how it doesn't matter how old they are, right? Like that we're all just assuming as long as they get to a certain age, fine. We'll all be fine with it. But of course that's not true. When you lose someone you love at any age, it's always just beyond sad. There's no excuse for it, right? And then you have to think about if everybody's just walking around waiting to die, how do you make sense of walking through life and having an ordinary day? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, part of what was interesting to me about my dad's death and part of what I really wanted to write about was that it was in no ways extraordinary and in the sense that it it kind of happened to all of us and it happened to my father at a relatively normal stage of life. He was 74 years old uh, and, and it was in no ways a tragedy. You know, we're surrounded by tragic deaths. You and I are speaking, you know, after the truly tragic deaths at an elementary school in Texas, you know, children dying is a tragedy. Someone being cut down young of a, of a disease or an accident is, uh, or, or an act of violence is a tragedy, but, but someone dying, you know, in relative old age, uh, after an incredibly rich and interesting and good life, surrounded by their loved ones, uh, and and hopefully uh, not in much pain and relatively at peace. Uh, th- that was my father's death. And, and that is not a tragedy. You know, that is almost as close as we can get to the idea of a good death. And part of what was interesting to me is it is still extremely not good. <laughs> you know, right. you're right. There's, there's no age, there's no circumstances under which it absolves you of grieving, you know, mm-hmm. and, and that's not to say I'm not grateful for my father living as long as he did. Uh, it's not to say I'm not grateful for, for the kinds of peace that attended his death in various ways, but, you know, do I wish my father had lived to be 94 instead of 74? Of course. And, and, I think even people who lose their parents and their loved ones at 94 long for more. You know, mm-hmm. we, we, of course, that's the nature of love. You want it to go on and on and on. And one of the real challenges of life is you have to square that with the fact that actually nothing and no one goes on and on and on forever. Oh, well, this is a little bit depressing, but it's true. I mean, I think about this stuff all the time. I mean, not depressing. And I mean, it is fact. It is, it is true. My grandmother passed away at 97 And I still think about her. I mean, I still miss her. Like, it doesn't matter. There's nothing that, nothing can make it better when somebody who should be on this earth is no longer on this earth. It's it's hard to wrap your mind mind around it, no matter what the age, even though we're trained for so long to expect it later. Truly, it's it's no more palatable than, than any earlier. I think that's right. I mean, many, 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 many things can make a death worse and more difficult, but very few things can make it altogether that much better beyond a certain basic point of gratitude. Yeah. I had this delusional moment a little while ago when uh, there was just so much grief and loss and everything. And I was like, I wonder, I wonder if there's a way to like get rid of grief. If you could just like let people know over and over again to expect it, that maybe the grief is this shock and the, the absence of someone. Like, could you prepare a child, say, enough that you could spare them the heartbreak of grief. And then I realized, well, of course, I mean, of course I realized that that would be almost impossible, but even if I tried my hardest, you can't protect against 
all the many ways that the death itself is traumatic and terrible, which happens sometimes. I mean, anyway, <laughs> so I gave up. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's foolish to ask the question. You know, I mean, a great many uh, very serious religious traditions uh, have, have tried to do exactly as you say, to, to remind people, religious and philosophical traditions, to, to try to make the inevitability of death and loss so omnipresent and so considered and so mundane that people will be able to live more peacefully and joyfully yes. within them, right? I mean, that's the the, the the kind of, you know, idea of non-attachment, the notion that there is, that we bring about a lot of our own pain by refusing to acknowledge the transience of all things. Uh, that these are, these are very serious and very interesting ideas. And, you know, we can only be who we are. I'm, I'm not everyone who's ever lived. I'm not a, a Buddhist monk. I believe people who have achieved this kind of, incredible peace and enlightenment around mortality. Uh, and, I, and I know people, I have people in my daily life who are far less troubled by the idea of death, especially of good death, as, as my father's was, than I am. But I personally seem to not be wired for, for the peaceful version. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to get rid of that sense of longing, right? Yeah, exactly. That's really what it is. It's the longing and the missing. And But I'm glad that, that my my theory is now a philosophical tradition. I feel, you know, I feel very validated in what I thought was a crazy, a crazy thought, which. No, uh, not at all. I mean, talk to the Stoics, talk to the Buddhists. They're in your camp. You know, yeah. they believe it is possible to not uh, make ourselves miserable over this kind of thing. I mean, it's really my kids. Like, I want to know my kids are okay and that they mm. won't miss me. Right. I, I wish I could figure out a way that like, you'll be fine. Like, they'll be fine. Like, it's okay. I don't know. Mm. Anyway, but. For a, just to, if I could read just one really poignant scene in, in your book, you wrote, th and this is about your father. You said, even so, for a while longer, he endured. I mean, his hymness, his Isaacness, that inexplicable, assertive bit of self in each of us. A week after, he had ceased to speak, having ignored every request made of him by a constant stream of medical professionals. Mr. Schultz, can you wiggle, wiggle your toes? Mr. Schultz, can you squeeze my hand? My father chose to respond to one final command. Mr. Schultz, we learned to our amusement, could still stick out his tongue, but his sweetest voluntary movement, which he retained almost to the end, was the ability to kiss my mother. Whenever she leaned in close to brush his lips, he puckered up and returned the same brief adoring gesture I had seen all my days. Oh my God, I'm going to cry in front of my sister and me at least. It was my parents' hello and goodbye, their sweet dreams, and I'm only teasing, their I'm sorry and you're beautiful and I love you, the basic punctuation mark of their common language, the sign and seal of 50 years of happiness. Oh, oh my gosh, just this image of him still kissing when he has lost all of his basic you know, faculties. It's just, oh my gosh. Anyway, I mean, I'm emotional. It's not, tell me how you feel, like even hearing it again. It's actually very moving to hear you read it, and I, I appreciate your kind of emotional openness in, in being moved yourself uh, by reading it out loud. I, I am brought back to the incredibleness of that experience and, and the beauty of it. It is true, by then my father had been in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Uh, he had not been able to speak for a week for no reason any of us understood. He was a little bit in kind of free fall in terms of all of his various uh, organ systems starting to fail him. And yet, you know, my mother's presence just jolted alive in him some very deep and fundamental and long-standing impulse of love and tenderness and connection. And, and uh, it's true what I say. It was one of the last things he was able to do was return her kiss. And it was just so beautiful. You know, I mean, a lot about grief is not beautiful. A lot about dying is not beautiful, but a few things are. And the capacity of that love to endure that way and to make itself manifest all the way to the end was very, very beautiful to me. Oh. Well, I'm so, I'm so grateful that you wrote it. In a way, it gives a lot of hope, right? That despite things that factually don't even make sense, that that affection and love and feeling and all of that can can sort of break through. So I'm glad you got to see that, and I'm I'm glad you had that as a model of a relationship, especially as you then share with us about your own relationship starting mm -hmm. and how how that 
goes. I mean, I feel like there's two schools of thought. One is my parents were so happy I can never have something as great. Why try? And another is my parents were miserable. I'm determined to have a happy relationship, right? So how do you feel like the model of having very happy parents affect, has, has affected you? Oh, I just feel incredibly fortunate. You know, I think that the behavior we grew up around is incredibly influential. I'm obviously not <laughs> the first or only person to think this, but, you know, I, I think that of all the kinds of privilege and good fortune that we talk about today, and I'm I'm lucky, I'm mindful, I'm the recipient of, of most of those, frankly. I, I think one of the great privileges you can grow up with is the privilege to grow up in a happy family. Mm-hmm. And I saw my parents, you know, not not of course just on my dad's deathbed, but but all of my days, uh, loving each other and being tender to each other and taking care of each other. Which isn't to say they didn't fight or have difficult moments or have differences. They were very different people in some ways, but they adored each other and they did not hide that adoration. And to be honest, I think even the hard moments, you know, even watching them fight or disagree or navigate the ways that they were very, very different over years and decades taught me everything I could possibly need to know to to build a happy relationship myself. And it gave me something to aspire to. But but beyond aspiration, I just think some of it is just, you know, it's it's, it's given, it's wired into you, it's your sense starting from your earliest days of of what love looks like and what it feels like and what it is. And I think that's an incredible gift to to give to children. And um, I, I am so grateful for that here, you know, in my own marriage. And it's interesting, you know, I mean, I hope that um, neither my partner nor I encounter a deathbed for, you know, preferably another, you know, eight or 900 years. But I, it is so easy for me to believe that the last impulse in my body would be, and my and my brain and my heart would be to return her kiss. I just feel like, you know, the kind of solace and comfort and, and connection and sharing that happens in a relationship. Like I just, I know in my, you know, <laughs> full healthy current, current capacities that, you know, all I ever want to do is, is go to bed curled up against her at night and, and wake up and see her first thing in the morning and somehow that feels like a mundane daily truth, but also like the deep existential one. Like, of course she would be where I would turn, you know, at, the, at every beginning and ending, not just, not just of the days. So I, I can understand my parents' love and I'm grateful for it because in some very concrete ways, I feel like it enabled mine. Oh man, this is like a tissue fest for me here. <laughs> I'm like, this. sorry about no, that. <laughs> no, it's it's poignant and beautiful in such a nice way. It's it's it really is switching gears, as they say, for a moment. You are the winner of the Pulitzer Prize, a staff writer for the New Yorker. What was it like to win the Pulitzer Prize? I mean, that is such a <laughs> <laughs> that is such a big deal. You know, can you tell me about that experience a little bit? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, you'll appreciate in the context of this conversation, one of my overarching and enduring feelings about it is I'm unbelievably glad it happened while my dad was still alive. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, my dad just adored and doted on his children. And in the most wonderful possible way, my my dad would have adored and doted on us, uh, my sister and me. Even if, you know, far from ever winning a prize, he had been, you know, bailing us out of jail once a month. I, he, he loved us and he loved us unconditionally and wanted nothing for us to, nothing more than, you know, for us to be, to be happy and, and, and to live meaningful lives. But, but it was a great pleasure for me. I think, I think I can't overstate the extent to which the pleasure of, of winning that was the pleasure of getting to call my parents and tell them, but it was really thrilling. I mean, I, I will not lie about that. I was, you know, at home and, work on a piece on some random Sunday night and my cell phone rang and I picked it up and looked at it and it said, David Remnick's cell phone. And, you know, when David Remnick uh, is calling you on his cell phone, either you're <laughs> extremely behind on a piece, which is not uncommon for me, uh, or, or, or something interesting is happening. <laughs> um, so it was, uh, it, it was, it was really, really thrilling. And, you know, my partner and I lived down in Maryland. Uh, this is before our baby was born. So we had the luxury of being able to just kind of get in the car right away and, and head up to New York. And, and she was thrilled and incredibly sweet about it and convened a bunch of friends up there. So yeah, it was, uh, it, it was an absolute thrill. Of oh course, an absolute honor. And I'm, I'm really mindful of the incredible work my colleagues, uh, I, and not, I don't just mean at the New Yorker, obviously my colleagues in the broadest sense, my fellow journalists um, just produce so much amazing work every year. And it's quite hard to feel like 
something as capricious as a prize is ever like truly earned, but I'm, but I'm certainly very honored. Yeah. It's so nice. I mean, there is something to that, right? If you, if you won something so important, but couldn't share it with the people closest to you in your life, like, would you still, like, would it matter? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, like it, I mean, I guess it probably would. I mean, I guess I would take the Pulitzer Prize, but you know, you know what I mean? <laughs> like there, there's part of it is, is the sharing of success. Absolutely. I know I was talking to my husband about that. He, you know, he lost his mother to COVID and it's been almost two years. And, you know, my grandmother, who I mentioned, who I was extremely close to, who was 97 and she was like my biggest advocate for writing, always asking me if, if I was writing and I've been trying to sell this book for so long and I just got the final copy and I was like, oh, I just, like, she was so close. She waited till she was 97. I still couldn't pull this thing off in time, you know? I was just like, I'm so sad that she just missed it. Like, cause she would have been more excited for me than anyone on the planet. And, and my husband was like, that's how I feel with my mom. Not so, he's a producer and he just like has this movie and he's like, that's how I feel about my mom. She just, how could she not be seeing it? So I don't know. Our only consolation to each other was sort of like, well, they still know. And, you know, on some level we feel like they're with us and that they know and that they are happy, but I don't know. There is something to sharing in just sharing the victory of those who came before us and who are our biggest fans. So yeah, I'm so happy no your dad was there. It. Yeah. I mean, obviously for me, the most acute form of that has nothing to do with professional success of any kind. It's that, you know, my, uh, my father did not get to meet my daughter and she of mm. course will never get to meet him. And, and that is, uh, you know, uh, I, there's nothing to be done about it. You know, it is what yeah. it is, but of course I, I know that that, uh, she would have brought him so much joy and he would have brought her so much joy. He loved babies. And, uh, oh. and I know she would have just adored him. And I, I often yearn literally for even just, you know, one picture, like one moment together that I could point to for her and say, you know, that's you with your grandpa. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, do you well, believe it's okay? Do, I mean, we you, talk, we talk no, a I lot know, about, I know, you know but it, who I, he was and I you know, know, but I'm still sure. sorry. I'm still, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm still sad for all of you that, that you don't get to have that. Do you feel on some level that like he's still here in some way? Do you believe in that at all? Or that he's watching over that the people who have passed, that there's something more than science can explain? Well, I certainly think there's something more than science can explain in the sense that, you know, I, I'm, I am a huge believer in science and I admire scientists, but I also think we're at the beginning of a very, very long road of making sense of, you know, ourselves and the earth and the cosmos. So, so by no means do I think everything already has a, you know, a, a clear explanation. And one of the wonderful things to me about life is that it's full of mysteries. Um, but I don't, I, I, I wish I could say that I believe that, you know, my father was, in some, in some sense, enduring, uh, you know, as, as who he was and watching over my life and and watching over my daughter's life. And it's such a beautiful idea. And I, I do on some level envy people who truly feel that. And I I think it's, it's a gift. I think it's a a way you feel or a way you don't feel. And I, I don't feel that way. And I'm prepared all the time to be humbled by everything we don't know and, and humbled, as I said, by, by the kind of grand mysteries of existence. But um, I can't say that I feel that I know that, you know, my dad in some form still exists and, and knows what's going on in my life. And I know your examination of all of this is in the book and, mm-hmm. you know, you wrestle with some of these topics, but I don't know. What are you working on now? What what could possibly come after? <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> moms don't have time to like fill in the blank, right? So yeah, exactly. uh, what am I working on? I'm, uh, uh, mostly I'm still just, um, you know, trying to be a part of the of the grand adventure of this book coming out into the world and talking to folks like you and your listeners and 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 really enjoying hearing from readers of this book which has been a real pleasure of, of publishing it I heard a lot of other people's grief stories and a lot of other people's love stories and and that's been really delightful uh, so most of my attention is still on that I am um you know back at the magazine trying to you know eke out some pieces <laughs> when I can <laughs> but mo- mostly I'm still focused on the book right now and that is just fine. <laughs> Do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Well, 
<laughs> I suppose <laughs> it's such a broad question. I know. Sorry. Advice, take it, no, take no, no, it no, it's any totally direction fine. you want. Yeah, advice exists at, at, at sort of every scale of the of the of the job and of the craft. You know, I guess I would say that if you feel you have something you want to write and it feels urgent to you and interesting to you and like something that can hold your attention for long enough to actually get the job done, which can be a very, very long time, uh, then, then you're probably right and you should trust that feeling. And beyond that, you know, there are so many things to be said about how to write well and how to build communities of writers and, and how to find editors and how to get your work done. And all of that is incredibly important, but none of it is important as important as simply sitting down in the chair and doing the writing. You know, that is not, nothing can happen and nothing matters uh, in terms of a literary community or the publication process or refining something you have written. Uh, nothing can happen until you sit down and to the best of your abilities, commit your thoughts to the page. So mostly my advice is just that old school advice of like, you know, sit down in the chair. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it's, it's good advice for a reason. <laughs> Catherine, thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience in the book and over this conversation. Thank you for writing with such beauty that even reading it for the second time brought tears to my eyes and, you know, giving me hope, hope that love is, you know, our most fundamental human thing that we all share and, and that how important love is. And I know that sounds hokey, but I, but I mean it. So thank you. Well, you don't have to, you know, apologize for it sounding hokey to me. I, I very much believe in it and that that's the core of the book. So I'm, I'm glad you feel that way as well. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. It's lovely to talk. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 